they were returned, as is sort of well known now and sort of become infamous, in a bright pink gift bag. And it was then that the penny started to drop about what this might be. That yeah, this was the moment that we had actually all been waiting for and that the notebooks were seemingly back. Welcome to the Cambridge University Library podcast, where we explore some of the cultural treasures to be found at one of the world's great libraries. My name is Sue Keogh, and you've just heard the voice of the library's head of communications, Stuart Roberts. And together in this episode, we're discovering the endlessly curious life and letters of the celebrated naturalist, Charles Darwin. With Cambridge University Library being home to the most extensive and important archive of Darwin's work anywhere in the world, it's made the perfect setting for a major exhibition of his correspondence, Darwin in Conversation. The exhibition also celebrates the conclusion of the Darwin Correspondence Project, one of the most important and longest running humanities projects in history, to collect, curate and transcribe the entire known correspondence of Charles Darwin. We'll also be joined by Professor Jim Secord, director of the project itself. And out of all of the items in this vast and priceless Darwin archive, there are two tiny notebooks which are particularly precious. One of them, Notebook B, contains Darwin's irreplaceable Tree of Life sketch. And after mysteriously going missing in the early 2000s, the notebooks were returned to the library in March 2022, following the launch of a worldwide appeal to find them just 15 months earlier. But their return, like their disappearance, remains a mystery. We still don't know who took them or why. Stuart Roberts, who is Head of Communications at Cambridge University Library and who is one of the first people to be notified that they'd made their reappearance. So when was it first realised that they'd gone missing? So the notebooks had been missing um, or recorded as missing since the early 2000s. They were taken out um, for a routine photography request in 2000 and then on a um, routine check of some of the archives in early 2001 they were discovered to be missing. So they were actually missing for the best part of nearly two decades. And how many items have you got in the library altogether? The University Library is absolutely vast. It's um, home to, we think, around 10 million objects. That includes 8 million books, over a million um, maps, for example, and other objects, manuscripts as well. So yeah, in total, we have about 10 million uh, items in our collection. That's across nearly 200 kilometres of shelving. So the University Library is just an absolutely vast monument to books and publishing and yeah, home to some of the world's great collections across the sciences and humanities. So what were the first thoughts about this? So with so many items in the library, was the first thought that, well, maybe it's just been mislaid, it's, it's ended up in the wrong place? For a, for a long time, that was the theory that um, previous librarians were working towards, and it's not unknown in a building of that size. Like I say, there are something like 200 kilometres of shelving. Uh, and for a long time, I think there was the hope that, yeah, these may have been misshelved, and the hope was that they would be discovered. As time went on, that theory, sort of held less and less credence and um, with the appointment of our new librarian Dr Jess Gardner the thinking and the landscape changed to try and consider other options as well given that in all that time they just hadn't been found and I think that's when some of those conversations those wider conversations started happening. And so you launched an, an appeal and Interpol got involved as well? This was obviously something that was thought about in great detail Jess knew that the notebooks were missing fairly soon after joining the University Library, obviously devastating news for her as someone who's devoted her life and career to the care of objects such as these. And we took expert advice both um, from the library community but also the external communities. And I think it was a combination of some of those expert views that led us to a believe that the notebooks had likely been stolen and not just misplaced given the amount of time involved and that B, we really should think about launching a sort of worldwide public appeal, if you like. And that's what we did in November um, 2020, on November 24th, which uh, is in known in, in sort of social media circles as Darwin Day or Evolution Day. That's the anniversary of the publication of On the Origin of Species. And so it's a day where, yeah, lots of people are already thinking and talking about Darwin. And that seemed like the right moment to launch our worldwide appeal. And at that point, before you launched the appeal and before they returned, did you have any theories as to why someone might have taken them? Only speculatively, um, really, you know, these are objects of, of, of great worth in the history of science. And 
people really feel a personal connection to some of these objects and that may have been the case here but the truth is we really don't know who took them and why they took them and why they returned them it is a genuine mystery so tell us now about the day they were returned so tell us about first of all where so where this this happened um where they suddenly appeared <laughs> magically appeared and then about the day that they were found they were returned as is sort of well known now and sort of become infamous in a bright pink gift bag um, that was left outside the door to the librarian's office on the fourth floor of the university tower. But it's an, also an area that students use as a, a, a rather grand table outside where students are often found sitting. This gift bag was left outside the door of the librarian's office sometime after the uh, library opened on March the 9th. So you'd have to be quite familiar with that area. So if you hadn't visited the library before, then you wouldn't just know to go up to the fourth floor and leave. You wouldn't know that the librarian's office was there. Yeah, not necessarily. It's not particularly signposted as such. Like I say, it is a public area. So it is an area that's used regularly. And it feels like just in the manner of return, given that it was addressed to the librarian, that obviously the person who brought the notebooks back knew that that's where she could be found. It does seem quite a bold move and as well there's the book drop outside where normally if you want to return something without going in you can just just pop it in this uh, in the box outside that's interesting isn't it that it was presented in this pink gift bag and with the note so who found it and what, what were their first thoughts when they found it did they even realize the significance i mean like you said there are a number of curiosities with the uh, with the return of the notebooks, just generally um, the way it was returned, the, the gift bag, um, the note that was left to the librarian um, that said, Dear Librarian, uh, Happy Easter X. And that was typewritten, wasn't it? Yeah, so no clues there. It was on a printed envelope. And um, it was found by one of the librarian's assistants. She came into the, that office area as she normally would, sort of just after nine o'clock in the morning. The gift bag was there. That in itself is not unusual. The librarian gets a lot of mail and a lot of things posted to her and left there. Um, Jess's assistant came in, put the, um, the gift bag down by the side of a desk and just started her normal day of sort of checking through emails. It was only a little bit later when she went back to the gift bag and took out the envelope and noticed the blue archive box that formed quite a major part of our appeal uh, in November 2020. And it was then that the penny started to drop about what this might be. And so what sort of theories have you got about who might have taken the notebooks and why? And also what prompted them to, to suddenly return them like this? We genuinely don't know who took them or who returned them. That may not even be the same person. I think what we can probably say with some degree of certainty is that I don't think they would have come back in the way they have if we hadn't launched the public appeal, whether that pricked someone's conscience. There was obviously a lot of publicity at the time. It went around the world. So it was clear to see to anyone who watched the appeal videos with Jess that she was just genuinely heartbroken by this. And it really had a profound effect, not just on Jess, who, like I say, has devoted her life to the care of objects such as these, but the library community as well. And as I'm certain that without that appeal I'm not sure we would have got them back in the time that we did. And with me today is Professor Jim Secord, Director of the Darwin Correspondence Project and you've been working on the project since 2006 leading a team of specialists who are just as enthused as you are. So could you tell us a bit more about the notebooks and why they're so significant? These notebooks are part of a series that Darwin kept after he got back from the Beagle voyage, when he was living in London. He keeps the notebooks as a kind of thought process, a kind of an intellectual diary of how to put together an explanation of where species come from. He's very concerned in, in them to gather information from all sorts of different people. Um, this is really is Darwin in conversation. He has conversations with his barber. He talks to his father, who's a physician. He talks to friends of his. He thinks about his own thoughts. He, has, he records some of his dreams in there. There's a dream about being hung. So he contemplates the reception of what it would be to think about a theory like this. And these are notebooks that Darwin's keeping for himself. He's presenting other things on the public stage of science in early 19th century London, but these are his own private thoughts. So it's very personal to him then. Yes, this is really a personal quest. And there Darwin at his most radical. 
these notebooks are telegraphic. They're more, they're kind of like um, stream of consciousness writing and the kind of thing that James Joyce did in Ulysses, where it's, you've got this kind of amazing stream of thoughts, but this isn't him thinking about, you know, odds and ends. This is him thinking about really big questions, but also how small details fit into those questions. So he's not necessarily expecting anyone else to read them or see them. These are really radical materialist kinds of thoughts and quite potentially they could get him in trouble or certainly wouldn't be well received by the polite circles in which a gentleman like Darwin was expected to move. So unlike the letters, the correspondence, then he's phrasing things in a slightly more um, uh, articulate way, perhaps. But in these, he's, he's getting it all out. So it's very, very fresh and very raw. Yeah, he doesn't really tell anybody about the fact that he's actually um, come up with this theory um, until quite a lot later, until after the theory is pretty much formulated. Um, and then at that point, he rather jokingly says that it's like confessing a murder to say he's been working on such a speculative topic. So the notebooks, they're very precious in the archive, but very precious to Darwin as well by the sounds of it. The B notebook and the C notebook, the ones that were recovered, are important because they show Darwin in a very early experimental state of his work. He's come up effectively with a theory that says that the, the reproduction that goes on in regular human life and ordinary processes and also goes on in that of other animals and plants is in some sense a, a small microcosm of the larger processes of reproduction that then lead to new creatures. So it's a theory of generation of species. It, it's quite different than the theory that he comes up with after he reads Thomas Malthus on the principle of population. Can you describe the Tree of Life sketch a little bit more itself? The Tree of Life sketch is very striking on the page. It says at the top, I think, and then below it, it shows the famous tree. Um, it's got, one of the things that's quite interesting about it is that it's got branches going up and some of those branches continue and they just show a, a line and other ones are species that have gone extinct and they show a little, they're like a little T at the top crossing it. And that, the tree of life is, is, is in some sense an experiment for Darwin. I think people often think it's the moment when he suddenly realized that we're all tied together through the process of evolution. But in fact, the moment he started thinking in evolutionary terms, Darwin already must have been thinking in trees or at least in terms of processes of one thing leading to another and going up. The thing about it is it's actually part of his early theory of reproduction. What he wants to show is the number of species that are still continuing on is also matched by the number of species that go extinct. So there's a balance between new species and old species. And that's the kind of theory that Darwin eventually throws away. What the Tree of Life is brilliant for me is that it shows Darwin as an experimental thinker, thinking through theories on the way to the theory that he finally adopts. And fast forwarding to modern day, so how much have these theories been developed um, and how much of what he was scribbling in his notebook in the 1830s, how much of that shapes our current way of thinking? Well, the theory of natural selection and evolution is really the foundation stone of modern biology and indeed much of the rest of the sciences. So it really remains a really important theory and that's why Darwin's work is still read and appreciated. One of the things I think that's really fascinating about the notebooks is that Dar they show Darwin also thinking about questions that have only fairly recently come together. For example, the fact that he's so interested in questions of reproduction, generation, and what we would call embryology is something that's really only come into evolutionary thinking in a strong way um, with the development of what's called Evo Devo in the last 20 years or so. So there's a way in which um, Darwin's thinking through these problems in a way that I think still has a lot of relevance for us. And it's, it's kind of interesting to see how the changing world of science brings up different aspects of Darwin's work. So let's talk about the, the project itself then. So he's clearly a very prolific letter writer and I'm uh, looking forward to finding out more from you about the sort of people that he was talking to and the conversations they were having. So how did the project begin? Um, you know, how did it start, this, this idea that you could collect all of this correspondence? Well, the project was really the brainchild of um, Frederick Burkhardt, who was a, an American philosopher, an academic administrator. And he, as a retirement project actually, decided it would be kind of fun to do 
um, the, the correspondence of Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, one of Darwin's associates. But then he realized that actually Darwin's correspondence hadn't been properly edited and published. Initially, they were just going to do the letters from Charles Darwin. But then very wisely, I think, they decided that correspondence is really a two-way street. Mm -hmm. And so they published the letters to and from. And that immediately vastly increased the scope of the project. But to my mind, it really made it um, really worthwhile because it wasn't just a huge monument to a man that was already pretty well known in some ways. Um, it made it a way of exploring the whole range of the sciences and culture in the 19th century in the kind of Victorian world that Darwin was part of. So tell me a bit more about the sort of people he was writing to then. So was it just eminent scientists or was it people from all different parts of society or, or who, who were these people that he was talking to? He writes to all sorts of different people and all sorts of people write to him. Um, for example, physicians in the Midwest who have their, one of their children might have a, a particular odd disease or a particular problem. There might be a person who has, say, an unusual beard and somebody actually sends him, you know, clippings of their beard. So really, there's all sorts of different kinds of things that come in. But of course, he also corresponds with a lot of very well-known people. Um, there's letters from the, um, William Gladstone, who was one of the prime ministers. Um, there's important letters from many of the major scientists of the period, long series of letters with his very good friend, Joseph Hooker, who was director of Kew Gardens. The correspondence, as you'd expect, is, is very varied. And the other thing, too, is it's not just scientific correspondence, it's family and um, personal correspondence as well. What does it reveal about the man himself, the, the way that he was writing and the, the people he was writing to and the, the tone of his letters? I think my favorite letters among the romantic letters are not from Darwin, but they're to Darwin. Darwin um, Darwin's letters, half the correspondence isn't preserved, but they're from a young woman named Fanny Owen, who was very vivacious, very intelligent. Um, Darwin recalls very much like they're rolling around in the strawberries together and um, they recall the, you know, playing various parts in um, romantic novels of the late 18th century that they are obviously reading together. When she gets married almost immediately when he leaves on the Beagle voyage, he's really very upset. He describes being in his um, hammock and just crying out, oh, Fanny, Fanny. And was that before he was married himself? Very much so. Darwin, for one thing, is very respectable about such things. And when he does get married, it's to his cousin, um, Emma Wedgwood, who's part of the famous Wedgwood dynasty of the potter, you know, the potteries. And um, she and he really are, are, have a deep caring for one another, I think. And there's some wonderful letters um, where Darwin is thinking about um, what, what's going to happen to his theory after he's gone or thinking about what Emma's views are about the fact that because of his beliefs and he's not Christian, that he may not be in heaven with her for eternal life. So he was interested in her views on, on the science elements. It, he wasn't just, it wasn't just the, the romantic partnership. I don't think Emma ever claimed to be, you know, particularly knowledgeable or interested in the science. Her contributions really are, for one thing, making it possible to Darwin, for Darwin to do his work by organizing a very complicated and large household full of children and servants and so forth. And that's, that's an important job in itself. And the other thing is that, um, given the family she comes from, she was very well read and um, very interested in questions of belief and faith. And her own beliefs are quite sophisticated. But she was a very important reader for Darwin and read his books and helped to make them more accessible. And what kind of sense did you get of the man, his temperament from reading the letters? Um, there's a couple that I've seen where he seemed to be in a bad mood on occasion. <laughs> I'm not, not well, saying he's like this all the time, but it was quite revealing, I thought. Darwin's famously a nice guy, and a lot of people like Darwin, not just because of his brilliant scientific ideas, but because he comes across in a very warm and personable way in his letters. And he writes, a, he's, he's really good at, at wheeling information out of people and getting people to do the most incredible things, like sending him pigeons from West Africa. On the other hand, even though he's seen to be a very nice guy, he does have bad days. He gets cross about the number of letters he gets sometimes, and especially from people where they're just asking questions that he thinks aren't very helpful or interesting. And um, he's frustrated that he's ill a lot of the times. 
Yeah, there's some lovely um, snapshots when you look at the exhibition itself and then the website that comes with it all. So darwinproject.ac.uk is, is really interesting. There's so much there to look at. And there was a quote about bees. <laughs> was it, I hate myself, I hate clover and I hate the bees. So I think he was conversing with, with beekeepers as well, as well, wasn't he? And Absolutely. all these different people. Yeah. Yeah, and he has the same sort of feelings about seeds at a certain point. He's trying to show that seeds can transport at long distances and you know, he gets them all set up properly and then they just sink and they, they don't get into the new continent or new place that they're supposed to be going to. So he's, he's very frustrated sometimes when his experiments don't do what they're supposed to do. And it's really interesting that it's not just letters then. So you've mentioned that he was sent clippings of beards, um, seeds, there's pigeons. Um, so what else was being sent back and forth in this correspondence? One of the things that's quite interesting about a lot of the letters is that they're not just texts, but they're also drawings and illustrations that are provided them. And there's maps that people provide. The, the correspondence is a very physical thing. And I think even, we have to recognize also that the letters themselves are physical things. Um, the way that letters were sent, as the exhibition shows, changed hugely during the 19th century. The advent of the penny post in 1840 was a godsend to somebody like Darwin, because it made writing not only much cheaper, but it made it much quicker, so that there were several deliveries a day to Down House. And the other thing that, again, you can see this on, on the website as well, is that it gives us quite an interesting perspective on early photography. So there's quite a bit of photography going backwards and forwards as well. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, Darwin's very much a technological new adapter. He, for example, bought one of the first typewriters in England. He has an early fountain pen. Part of Darwin's interest in new technologies involves his interest in new ways of illustrating things. Photography could be very useful if you're trying to understand one of his main subjects, which was the subject of human expression. Was he the, the first person to really analyse expressions like that? Because it strikes me that leading up to this, throughout the history of art, people are always trying to capture emotions. But before Darwin, were people really thinking about the, I suppose, the psychology behind it? There's a long tradition of physiognomy, which goes back into at least the 18th century, which you would be able to judge a person by the character of their face and the way that it looks. Darwin's interested both in the more fleeting expressions um, but he also wants to understand them as part of his evolutionary program. He wants to show that effectively many of the expressions we have can be seen, say, for example, in very early children, which would represent an early stage of development, or that expressions that we have, how do those relate the, to, to those that are present in the higher apes? He's always trying to show connection between things. So the project it first began in 1974, though how many letters have been amassed and, and objects as well? There are about 15,000 letters in all, and we keep on discovering new ones all the time. So we sent the 30th volume of the um, edition off to press, but we already have several dozen more letters that have come in just in the short time since that's happened. So but we think we have most, the great majority of the ones that are out there. One of the things to stress about the project is just the incredible range of skills that it requires to actually carry out such um, a project with so many letters and how skills need to be handed down because 50 years is longer than people's careers on these things. So it's a great number of people we who have been involved in the project very strongly and directly. So tell me a bit more about the logistics of doing this and, and the basics of reading his writing. How easy has it been to read Darwin's handwriting? Reading Darwin's handwriting is a real skill and the letters always go through a very severe process of multiple readings against the manuscript. Um, one of the letters um, that really stood out for me when I looked at the exhibition myself was one where, and I don't know if it's to save paper perhaps, but it was written uh, horizontally at first and then it looks like it turned it around 90 degrees and then it goes, goes cr crossways. So was that kind of thing quite, quite difficult to read? It certainly looks beautiful. Those are difficult to read. They're, you can get your eye in. Um, they're called crossed letters and they're intended, like you say, to save paper because it costs per sheet to send. And if you're sending across the world, it's very important to not be spending a lot of money to do that. And also, the thing that you've touched upon that I'm finding really interesting is that people weren't working in isolation. So you've got one person reading the letters, you've got other people trying to amass them, then you've got specialists in botany and zoology. 
Could you tell me a little bit more about this, about the fact that it's such a collaborative project? The project started in 1974, and since then there's been many dozens of people who have been working on the project, and they range from the group of women who worked with Frederick Burkhardt, um, first transcribing the letters from photocopies, um, all the way to people who have really detailed knowledge, say, of late 19th century um, zoology in Germany. Really, I like thinking of the project as a kind of league of superheroes in some ways, uh, that, that everybody has different skills and can do particular sorts of things that make the project what it is. These are th nearly a thousand pages, many of them, some of them over a thousand pages. So it's, it's really quite an extraordinary accomplishment to get all that published. And also, of course, to have it freely available online. Mm, that's incredible. So that's around 15,000 items, is that right? Yeah, there's about 15,000 items in the correspondence. Um, up until the origin of species, Darwin threw away a lot of his letters. And so, although we have a pretty good knowledge of his letters from the Beagle Voyage, after that, it was more or less he kept things that were scientifically useful to him or that were particularly important personally. So it really opens up a whole new field of understanding about what's happening in science and in Victorian society in, those, in that time. And you were saying when we first started the conversation about how it took him quite a few years to present his theories. So was this because he was busy refining it and also through the conversations he was having with so many people that was helping him refine his ideas? Or was it anything to do with the times that he's living in? He was also thinking, well, I'm not, not sure the world is ready for this yet. <laughs> you know, he thought there might be a bit of a backlash. And I think there are two aspects to it. One is that there are some things he realizes that he needs to know about. Um, he needs, for example, a much better understanding of what a natural species is and how variable species are in nature. And that, as a result of that, he gets very interested in barnacles. That provides him with real zoological expertise, which is quite important to the reputation that sits behind the origin of species. Um, the other thing is there are a lot of problems and issues to work out. It's not a simple question. And although I think it's relatively easy to summarize the principle of natural selection. It's really just competition for scarce resources leading to individual competition, and then those that are successful going on to reproduce and lead new species. But you publish that like in a page or a short article, which in fact actually happened, it's not going to have much effect. It's all the surrounding evidence. It's the way it's netted into a, a story in a way, a narrative of other kinds of scientific developments that makes it so it's a theory that really works. And then I think there is a certain element in which Darwin um, procrastinated. Um, he certainly did more with barnacles. And he even says that later on. He says, I wonder whether it was worth the time. Um, it's not that it's not important, but it's given what else he was sitting on. I think it's it got a life of its own. How do you feel personally now that it's reaching a conclusion? Because you've worked on this so closely since 2006. I'm really glad that it, we finally finished it. I think for one thing, it's very important when you begin a project like this, that it actually get done. And I, I, it would have been, I think, awful to have to say, well, we started editing the correspondence of Charles Darwin, but in fact, we weren't able to do it. And I think that's due a lot of it to the fantastic team we've had. And also, I think it's due to some incredibly generous donors. And part of that also means that there's a legacy that goes after the project. I mean, the, the library has funds to keep the website going into perpetuity, to make sure that it's maintained, um, to make sure that new letters are identified and put up for it, and also that new projects that are relating to 19th century science and to Darwin can actually be supported and developed. I think that what makes it so interesting is that there's so many routes into this. So let's say you're interested in different theories around communication, or botany, or zoology, or even barnacles, <laughs> then there's so many routes into this that are going to be fascinating for so many people. One of the things that's really important, and I really hope people do this with the correspondence, is that they not just use it to think Darwin is this kind of 30 volume monument and this vast website, but instead they think this is a way of shedding light on a whole range of other questions. In other words, this is the correspondence of nearly 2,000 other people and sheds light on their lives and what they're thinking about, what they're doing. And we've always tried to make sure the footnotes really help people to do that. So I really hope that this means that Darwin isn't just this kind of great statue out there, but he's actually something that's 
you know, living and moving among the other discussions that are going on about where science has come from. And what about Darwin himself? Tell me about his legacy. One of the things that's really good about the Darwin Correspondence Project, and indeed if you read the notebooks carefully, is they show that Darwin is actually very much part of a community of people. He belongs with lots of different people. He is in conversation. And so instead of thinking about Darwin as some, you know, basically dead statue of a man with a beard, I think it's much more effective to think of Darwin as someone who's, you know, in the heart of London, talking to people, dealing with really complicated questions, gathering information from thousands of other people about how to put together a theory. And I think that's a much better lesson for thinking about the way that science works than just thinking, you know, Charles Darwin did it all. I think that's not a very helpful model. Um, I think we need to think much more about these as collaborative, ongoing activities in which we build on the work of others. Thank you so much to my guest, Professor Jim Secord, Director of the Darwin Correspondence Project, and to Stuart Roberts, Head of Communications at Cambridge University Library. So despite the two-decade mystery of who stole Darwin's notebooks and why, they're back in their rightful place, so there's still a happy ending. However, if you do have any insider info, then let us know. Maybe you could call, you could email, or why not write a letter? To find out more about Darwin's fascinating life, and see full transcriptions of over 15,000 letters, just go to darwinproject.ac.uk.